of setting up an environment uh, that is. Uh, I found actually space uh, import simpy colon print simpy dot. Simpy. When you type that command, um, go ahead and type conda install. I'm oh, sorry, conda updates. And that, and that, I think we might have been using a few Simpy commands that are in one, version 1.1 and not 1.0. I think. So just make sure your Simpy version is updated in your 2.2.3 environment. There. Is it, are people getting 1.1.1 or mm -hmm. you are? Okay, so maybe it's fine. <clears throat> okay, so um, oh yeah, I wanted to say one thing about here. If you haven't voted yet here, please do so if you want to influence what I teach in the next lecture. It looks like Directory optimization. I think I might do that one first um, because I think you might be very interested in using it for some of your projects, and, um, and it's a pretty fun topic. And then we've got um, this is the second one so far, so we'll talk about um, different types of orientations, um, Euler angles, body fix, space fix, quaternions, Rodriguez parameters, etc. We won't go over every single one, but we'll give you an idea of what those mean and how you might use them and why they're useful. And then uh, we may be able to do all three of those two, religious immunization, advanced and by life. And then uh, I'll see if I can show some of you. But anyways, vote if you haven't voted. We've got seven votes. There's a few more people in class and then I'll decide on those over the break. And, uh, and we'll do some of those topics close the class. Okay, so last time we got uh, through this notebook. Um, right now, all right, so I guess we need to decide, oh, we need to do this on the server or on the, uh, oh, on your, so you can um, either open the notebook that we started last time on the server or download it now to your computer. And then if you open up, um, sorry, I think. Um, <clears throat> let let ha, how many people want to download it right now and get it going on your computer instead of the server? Yes or no? Because we could just start at the server. Uh, so I'm gonna. Here's here's some I'm on bicycle and I've got that notebook we worked on and if I do download as notebook and then save it and save it somewhere that you um, know where it is I'll just drop it on my desktop and once you save that file um, the key thing is we want to open it with uh, while we're in this environment. And there's two ways to do that. One is from the command line, or the other is you could use the program called Anaconda Navigator that's installed, which is basically a GUI that gives you buttons to press instead of these commands. Um, I'm going to do it right here, though. So I've got my, um, this thing is activated here. And if I type, actually, I'm going to, this is going to screw up because I don't have win windows right here to do the commands. Oh, in fact, uh, that might take too long. Um, what you want to do is, in Windows, if you put it on your desktop, you can type the change directory command, and then it'll look something like, uh, I don't know where they, like users, JSON, desktop, or something like that. So you want to, you'll have to type the full path. To, to wherever your 
wherever that folder is that you put it in. And once you get there, um, if you type that correctly and you type DIR, it'll list all the files there. So I'm going it's a little bit different here in Linux, but uh, if I go there, I'll see a bunch of files and uh, that that IP, mine's called prep 2017, right? So you basically want to make sure you're in that directory. And I can't remember, you could try this command, pwd may work to tell you which, if you're in the right directory. So it says I'm in my, my desktop. Is anybody not getting to their desktop via the command line? No? Everybody's fine? Okay. Um, and then you can just type Jupyter Notebook. And you'll see the notebooks here, right, that you can open uh, the same as uh, you, do, you do on the server. And I already have mine open over here somewhere. Got too many notebooks with the same names now. Uh, not there. Not there. <laughs> here. So you, you should see that same kind of thing, local host something, notebook and the name of your notebook, if you got it opened up on your computer. Raise your, and raise your hand if you don't successfully do that, or not successfully able to do that. The <clears throat> you can accept there's that detail about the uh, environment. So on the navigator, um, I think I have it installed, except that it fails. <laughs> uh, on the navigator, there's a button in there that says environments. And you should see that MA223 environment listed. And you want to make sure you like select that environment and then open up Jupyter with that environment. OK? Um, I got two. My computer's too messed up, full of all kinds of installed things. But does anybody not have this notebook open, either either on the server or or not, or the, on the server or on your computer? Okay, so that all worked. I feel I feel like that was going to be uh, more painful than it was. Okay, so we worked through this system, remember, um, and we got. Well, this is not the notebook I wanted. I thought it was the notebook I wanted. Yeah, here. No, that's not it either. Jeez. This one. Right, this is where we, we got, um, <clears throat> I believe, last time. So we formed FR and FR star manually. And then I showed you um, this convenience method here. Health Keynes method uh, that will form FR and FR star. Okay, and uh, and we got those. And then um, I also showed you that this mass matrix. And I, I wrote this as G. I may have wrote it as F last time, but I realized I had two Fs. One one is the F. That's the force that we're applying. So I, I changed that to G. So that's the mass matrix and the um, um, non, everything that's not linear in the U dots there. OK, and this looks like M U dot equals G. All right, OK, so your equations in motion will always be able to be put in this form. And this um, fr, yeah, that's a vector plus. Um, I'm using, now we're going to get confused with the type of vectors. fr star equals mu dot minus g. All right? So those equations, and then in our case, they're um, r equals 1 to n for a holonomic system that we have. So those are able to be extracted. 
And I think that we talked about um, that this, op this here, right, if I want to put this in the uh, first explicit first order form, uh, then you can write u dot equals m inverse g and do that matrix multiplication. Let me make sure mine is um, all run here. So I'll let that run a second. Uh, the key thing, though, is this is uh, doing a matrix inverse, especially as um, the, M, uh, the size of that matrix is big, is a nasty operation. And uh, for small n, you could do this symbolically. Uh, but the best way to do that is to solve it via Gaussian elimination. And it's just a linear system. You probably have seen A x equals B. And that's all we have here. Right? This is a n by n, n by 1, and a n by 1. So we can solve this linear system uh, too, and, and, I, and I'm going to do that now. Uh, for example, if I want to find out what u dot is, if I take that mass matrix M, SymPy has a lot of uh, solve methods. Um, for matrices, the LU decomposition, that's what this uh, stands for, LU solve, is a um, reliable way to do Gaussian elimination. And, and it's more efficient than taking the inverse directly. So if I, uh, I called this, oh, I'm sorry, we're going to use Kane dot mass matrix um, dot LU solve and then Kane dot forcing. Right, those, how you access those. And if I do that, um, I'll get this uh, 3 by 1 in our case. Now, I, I'm not going to print that to the screen because it ends up being a, a big mess. Or maybe we should just do it for the heck of it. But uh, it actually takes a, takes a, solving it doesn't take that long, but printing it, Takes takes a bit, and you can see how how nasty that is, just for a three by three. That um, it'll take a minute to. There we go. Right, so that's that's the solution there. I wouldn't call. I wouldn't try calling simplify on it because it might take all day. Um, but anyways, um, we've got u dot now explicit form of the right-hand side. And this is the form that most numerical integration routines require that you pass to it, a u dot. Um, if n is large, you should do this solve numerically instead of symbolically, just a, okay, in general. <clears throat> and, uh, but I just wanted to show you that. And, and you could even do, and just to show you a, a difference here too, if I do, um, there's a nice little IPython uh, command here, time it. And if I do, if I do this uh, cane.massmatrix.lu solve, cane.forcing, it'll uh, give me an estimate on how long it takes to do that. And then I could also do cane.massmatrix.inverse times cane.forcing. And time that too. Spelled it wrong. Mass matrix. So symbolically, um, this was able to do a thousand loops right there, and the average is uh, 1.4 milliseconds. And now, this, if I do the inverse explicitly, which it can also do for this three by three. Um, We'll wait and see what it tells us, but it's obviously taking longer than 1.4 milliseconds, or even a, th a thousand times that. Right? This to do a thousand loops of that just took us a second, a second and a half. And geez, this one is uh, ran faster when I did it before. Uh, 
the main gist of this is um, be careful trying to, you know, there's, there's a limitation in symbolics and uh, and you want to be careful and there's um, the right algorithms to use to do certain things. In this case we're trying to solve a linear system and this is a good algorithm, right? And that's a bad algorithm that is being run behind the scenes. And I'm surprised this thing's <laughs> not completing. Um, it completed for me before, but um, and there's another key. There's another interesting thing too is that uh, that mass matrix is um, almost 99% of the time going to be. Um, a symmetric positive semi-definite matrix. And it turns out that you can use, um, instead of LU decomposition, you can use Cholesky decomposition. And um, it, would, it would actually run, uh, be a slightly faster algorithm, since we know that too. But, uh, well, geez, I don't know why it's not, that, that, was, that was not taking so long before. All right. I'm, I'm going to kill my kernel. <laughs> you guys can do that at home. Did anybody complete that? Um, I'm just going to restart and run all. Okay, so uh, the next thing here is that we, we have these equations of motion, and we want to jump over to numerical land and simulate them. We want to see how uh, we want to integrate them with respect to time and let those, uh, and, and see what, how, uh, these things, it evolves with respect to time. Uh, in particular, we're going to solve the initial value problem for that. that uh, so we're going to give it initial conditions and, and then let it evolve through time and see what happens. So the easiest way to do that, we'll start with that, is um, we're not going to import PyDi. And PyDi has um, two key things. One, it translates symbolics to efficient numeric code. And uh, two, it um, um, adds in simulation and visualization, I guess. Maybe that's, that's technically three, three things. So um, the, I think actually I want to, imp I don't think I have a, uh, import from PyDi dot, uh, from PyDi import, I don't know, maybe this will work, PyDi dot system. Sorry, I think you have to do from pydi.system import system. So we have, there's this system object in pydi that um, basically contains all of the symbolic and all the numeric information to describe a system. And um, so what, uh, if we look at that help file, it, um, it's set up to work directly with the results of the equations of motion method up here. So we have this variable cane that represents an equation of motion method, and that has all the symbolic information in it. Okay? And then uh, these things are where we specify numbers for the different constants. In our case, we have an F and a T, the force and the torque, that are going to be these specified um, items worth of time. You can give it different kind of numerical solvers um, for, for different problems. There's uh, different reasons sometimes to use different um, numerical integration routines. You give it the initial conditions. You give it times, which is a, an array of time values that you would like the solution at, right? So I want x at time whatever I put in this array. And so we're going to pass all this information in. And the constants are a dictionary, a Python dictionary that maps symbols to numbers, right? Because we're going to plug in numbers for the symbols. And the specified is also that, except that you can pass in other things like functions here, which um, become useful. And we're not going to worry about this. We'll just use the default one. It uses the SciPy package, which has a bunch of integration uh, routines. And this one, ODE int, let's just uh, look at that briefly. If I um, search SciPy ODE int, we'll get to their documentation. And this is a nice general purpose integrator. 
um, integrated system of ordinary differential equations, and it uses an older library called um, ODE PAC, and in particular, the routine out of that called L soda. And um, in, this is just a battle tested um, uh, uh, library, but it does, it's, it's, it's got an interesting thing. Um, it'll switch between two integration routines depending on if it te detects the problem is, is stiff or not. Okay, so when, when, that in, when we have rapid changes in the evolution of the states, um, you want to take smaller time steps usually as you integrate. And when you have slow evolution, you might want to, sp you can spread out a little. You don't have to evaluate the, the function so many times. So what you do, you basically create a function that, that computes the derivatives, this u dot that I have up here. You give it some initial conditions, you give it time, and then there's other stuff. But it will integrate those equations in motion if you pass it the function that calculates u dot, basically. So what's happening in the background of um, pi di is it's, it's making use of that. So if I can find the right notebook. Um, so let's create this system. So I'm going to call it sys equals system. First thing I'm going to pass it is, is cane, right? That's this equation of motion method. And then um, actually above it, let's do a few things. Let's say, oops. Let's say constants. These are all the constant parameters of our system. And I think I have them. We, we list them at the top. I'll just copy and paste. These are all our constants. So I'll control C that. Come back down. And I'll paste these here. So those are the symbols. But I want to map them to um, values. So I'll, let's do 50. And it's good to note your um, units. And uh, I'm going to copy these from another notebook because so I make sure I write the values that I want to use. Okay, so you can um, copy this here. So basically, for each symbol, I gave it a, nu a number that has compatible units. Okay, so you want to be careful about this, too. You don't want to have um, centimeters in some things and, and then um, your gravity defined in meters per second squared. So make sure they're all sort of in the base units. In general, I always just put everything in meters and um, for length. Uh, newtons for force, kilograms for mass, and seconds is time. And um, and if you do that, your 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 units will stay compatible. And I'll add the units for the last two here, um, and that's going to be uh, kg meters squared and um, meter. Okay. So we basically just tell it the numbers that we want to use. For all that, and then um, we also um, need <coughs> this specified. So to start off with, we're going to say that f and t are just zero for all time. Okay, so that we don't we're, we're going to not apply those force the force and that torque. And then uh, we also need some initial conditions. I'll call it init It's also a dictionary. And in this case, um, we need an initial condition for every single um, state variable, which are our q's and our u's. I'm going to make q1 is how much you stretch that spring away from the wall. And I'll make the rest of them 0. q1 will be enough to get our system moving. Uh, but if you made these all zero, our system wouldn't move. So we're going to give one initial condition here. And I'm going to come up above that cell, create a new cell. Um, have I talked about NumPy at all? I don't think I have. 
All right, so NumPy is the, um, in Python, you have to import all these libraries, even for the base things that you might expect. Um, for example, in MATLAB, everything's a matrix, right? By default, you have um, a matrix data type that does matrix-like things. Um, in Python, you don't. And we get, we, instead of a matrix per se, we get um, n-dimensional arrays from NumPy. So I can have 1D arrays, 2D arrays, which are matrices, 3, 4, 5, whatever I want in dimensionality. But NumPy is the array manipulation package for numerics. And it has um, basic um, vectorized operations on, on arrays. And it also has uh, basic um, linear algebra routines that you can run on, on arrays. And a um, few other things like fast Fourier transforms and other, so a few other basics. But essentially, it is the default and most popular array data type that all of the SciPy system uses. Okay? So we'll create an array right here, and I'll give you an example. We want an array of time values. So MP has a function called linspace, which is very similar to the one you've probably seen in MATLAB. Let's simulate from 0 to 5 seconds. And um, let's say we want, an out, we want um, a certain number of those um, spaced equally. So let's get it 100, 100 values. And then if I uh, print times, we've got an array object. Okay, so it went ahead and created um, from 0 to 5, divided, and now I have 100 objects there. And, uh, and so we're going to, and then if I look at times.shape, it's a, an array, a 1D array. There's only one value here um, of, of length 100. Okay? If it was a 2D array, it would say like 100, comma, um, 500 if it was a... 100 by 500 matrix. And then if you have more, you can have as many dimensions as you want. But we get an array there of time values. And I think that's, uh, is that all that we need to pass in? Method, constant, specified, initial conditions, and times. Yes, it is. So what we can do here these are all optional arguments. So constants equals constants. Um, specifieds equals specifieds. Initial, I think it's actually initial conditions equals init cond. Our variable name. And times equals times. And we get an error. I forgot I B. Maybe O is not defined. Underscore. Underscore, right? Name error. IBO is not defined. What did I do? Oh, it's I capital B underscore. All right, so now we have a system. And notice that um, all those, these things are sort of attached to the system now. I can access a lot of those um, things that we passed in. Um, now that we have this thing, though, all we have to do in the most simple case is call the integrate method. And what does it return? Well, let's look at its type. I called it traj for trajectory. It's an ND array. It has shape 100 by 6. Okay, so it has 100 rows corresponding to each time value that we were interested in, and six columns. Each column is associated with one of the six states in the order that we um, specified them in in the Keynes method object. So up here, when we define Keynes method, we said that Q was Q1, Q2, Q3 in that order, and then st stacked on top of U1, U2, U3. All right? 
Now for plotting this, uh, we'd really like to plot at this point. If we um, import matplotlib.pyplot as plt, matplotlib is the plotting library. And let me just point out on our website, if you haven't um, looked at that, like I put some resources here. These are the documentations for the libraries we'll use. We've only used SymPy so far. Um, <clears throat> that's SciPy Lecture Notes. That is the best way to learn all these tools, I think, one of the best resources. It goes through everyone from start to finish, and you can get a picture of like how all this works. It's sort of like tutorial for scientific computing in Python. So check that out. There's also um, NumPy for MATLAB users. A lot of it's similar, but there are a few details that aren't. So if you are familiar with MATLAB, you could see, check on those. Like if you know the MATLAB command, you can use that guide to figure out what you need. And um, <clears throat> matplotlib, for example, I really like their documentation because if I uh, go to it and click examples, um, you just scroll through here and find like a plot that you might be interested in making. Here's a sand key diagram. Those are fun. And it shows the uh, code right there to make the plots. So um, it's a really nice documentation there. And uh, all we're going to do is make simple line plots, sort of like uh, probably the f first example. Um, well, we'll just make one. OK, so where am I at here somewhere? Um, in the notebook, you call this command matplotlib notebook, percent matplotlib notebook. And what this does is it enables all the plots that you make to show up as interactive plots in the notebook. If you didn't call that, it wouldn't, sh it wouldn't show the plot, actually. All right, so now we want to plot this trajectory. If, uh, in the most basic case, if I call plt.plot times versus traj, I get something out, right? This shows the, on the x-axis, time, and then on the y-axis, the units for all six of those things. And, but we have units of meters, we have units of radians, and then meters per second and radians per second. They're not normalized values. Those are meter. Is exactly the we put in as initial conditions and constants in meters, and in um, uh, yeah all those all those values that we put in. Um, notice it, it's a little sp sparse here. Maybe we should have used more than a hundred points. Let's go ahead and do that. Since that, if I go back up to um, my uh, actually all I have to do is this. Um, Right before the integrate, I can just change sys dot times equals np dot lens space zero to five, and let's make num equals a thousand instead. Integrate it. Now we got a thousand by six. Now we make our plot. And um, oh yeah, I, did, I didn't change times, so let's change this to sys dot times, and then we get our plot. Okay, so that's a little better resolution of the uh, motion. Let's make this plot look a little nicer. Um, if we do, um, this is a nice command in matplotlib called uh, subplots. And subplots says I want a, uh, in our case, a six by one grid of subplots. And then, um, I can write a little loop uh, for the, um, let's just do i in range 6, right? For each of these six variables, we want to make a separate plot. So then I can do axes i, the ith axis, dot plot, sys dot times, and, and then um, traj, we get all the rows. We index this NumPy array now. I get all the rows, comma, the ith column. And then if I do that, I get them all separate. So that was a nice quick way to do that. And um, 
but a legend might be helpful. So let's do uh, on the last axis, negative 1 will give me the last one. I can do um, set x label, time and seconds, right? And then um, let's add axes i dot set y label for each one. And what we'll pass into here, um, we could pass the I'm going to come up here and create a uh, vector called x that has all our symbols in it. q1, q2, q3, u1, u2, u3. So if I get the ith x, should set my label to all of my generalized coordinates now. q1, q2, u3. So that, and then we got times. Now it makes making a little more sense. These, uh, this is meters, remember, this is radians per second, I mean, sorry, radians, meters per second, radians per second, there. Um, <clears throat> if I want to make the math, though, here's a nice, if I do SymPy latex version of that, matplotlib understands latex, uh, you have to do one thing, though, mode equals inline, and that will uh, make sure to put dollar signs around the LaTeX code there. And then if I run that, notice it um, now rendered these with proper subscripts. This is actually using LaTeX to get the mathematics to look correct. Okay, and then maybe we want, maybe we want units um, to help us there too. Let's just create um, units equals meter meter per second, I'm sorry, radian per second, radian per second, um, meter, I'm sorry, radian. <laughs> so it's meter, radian, radian, then meter per second, radian per second, and uh, radian per second. And then what I could do is do a plus, you can just add strings, uh, units, Let's put a space, at least, and then plus units i. And if I run that, and then lastly, um, there's a nice little command called tight layout that will maybe make that not look so bunched up. And you can um, make this bigger by dragging that. Um, oh, another nice thing is uh, on the subplots command, there's a share x equals true. If I do that, share x equals true, then when I use the little zoom tool, like say I want to zoom into here, it'll zoom all the axes to the same time span. So that share x equals true. And you can, this takes you back to the original plot. You can then cycle through any zooms that you did. You can pan and zoom, and you can save it as a PNG if you want it to, or maybe other different types too, I forget. Okay, so we got, we got a, pr a plot here now of these trajectories. Um, and we see that um, Q1 bounces back and forth between 0 0.5 and 5 meters. I mean, um, 0.05, uh, 5 centimeters and 5, negative 5 centimeters. And then um, these are in radians. We could change those to degree because I never can remember what anything is in radians. So um, here's a quick way to do that. If I say, um, uh, what's the easiest way? Convert. Let's put a little... This is a quick way to make a one-line function called lambda, a lambda function. For the first one, it just returns x. For uh, the second one, we want it to convert to degrees. So NumPy has a degree, sorry, a radian to degree function. So if I just list these conversions, lambda 
x in p radian 2 degree x and let's do them in, in separate lines uh, and we'll just repeat here lambda x returns x and then copy those two so that will basically say um, these are little mini functions. It takes in x and returns what you, on the other side, what's on the other side of the colon. So it'll do nothing to the q1 and u1, but it'll convert from radians to degrees for all the others. So now uh, let's change these to degree. And then um, here what we'll do is uh, say convert we want the ith function in there and then if we use the parentheses it'll call that function on trajectory all right there we go so now we can interpret this a little better um, now we see uh, q2 is that first angle is going back and forth between two and negative 2.5 degrees. And then Q3, the one at the bottom pendulum, it's wiggling more between 5 and negative, negative 5 and 5 degrees. There. So there we've got a nice plot that shows us the simulation. Okay? Um, we see that it behaves, um, this one, U2, it's very sinusoidal looking, so that, uh, that the velocity there, uh, but it's it's just sort of wiggling back and forth in some way, right? Well, if you really want to see how this does, um, let's for, let's make an anim animation of that. So an matplotlib has some animation functions too. We have a planar thing, so it's nice for planar animations. Uh, you can also do a 3D thing, but um, um, it's not the speediest of animation. So if you have lots of things moving around, it might be slower, but it can work, and you can make um, some neat things with it. But I'll let's let's uh, create a little plot here. The first thing, though, is uh, we're going to need the coordinates of all the points. So if you recall, we had PAB, and <clears throat> if I do PAB dot position from O, the origin, to matrix expressed in the in frame those are my first set of points let's plot um, uh, also the um, PBC which was the, the second joint two matrix in the in and then um, PC which was the bottom one And that in the end. And this one, uh, let's simplify. So this is the, <clears throat> the z coordinates all zero, right? We, we just have planar motion. Uh, but this gives us a point, that's the x, y coordinates of the first point, the second point, and the third point. So we can use those equations here in our animation to locate those points. So let's create uh, another figure. This time I'm just going to make, I'm going to use the same subplot command, but I'm only going to make a one by one. And um, <clears throat> what we want to do is sort of, I'm going to plot some lines associated with these points. And uh, we'll start with um, P, uh, let's do ax.plot. And it takes a list of x values and a list of y values. Well, we're going to plot a 0 for point O, and then uh, Q1, and then I'm going to use underscore N, and, I, and we'll create those in a second, and I'll show you why. And then um, the next one is L, let's use underscore N times, um, this time, don't use SymPy, use NumPy, right? We want numeric things, so sine of um, Q2 N plus a Q1 N. And then the last point is a L N 
times uh, np dot sine of uh, q2n plus q3n plus ln times np dot sine q2n plus q1n. All right, I'm going to put those. Um, so that this is the x coordinates of uh, four points. All right. And well, what are these q1 and qn? Let's uh, make those. We want to just grab sys dot um, coordinates. Sorry, constants. L and that'll give us the numerical value of LN. And I need an equal sign there. And then Q1N equals sys dot um, coordinates Q1. I pass in the symbolic to get the numeric back. Q2 and Q3N equals sys dot coordinates. Q3. All right, so now all these will be numbers, right? So we, we gave the, this is how you access a value from the dictionary. I pass in the symbol, it'll return me the number because we predefined that relationship. And now I can use those numbers in this plot. We need now the y coordinates. So if I comma and then do uh, 0, 0 for the first one, 0 for the second one, negative. Ln times np cos of q2. And then the last one is um, negative Ln, and we've got to be careful here, q2n. We want to make sure we, all use, we use all numbers here, q and n. This is supposed to be a plus. Um, times np cos q2n plus q3n plus np cos q2n. And I think that looks right, but it's not. Illegal arguments to sub uh, subplots. Uh, This dot O. Oh. Doing that right. We pass, what do we pass into the chain? Uh, oh, sorry. It's supposed to be initial conditions there. That was my mistake. These are not coordinates. That's um, right. We want the We want to plot the uh, thing in its initial condition. So this will give us those numbers that we put in. Still got an error, key error. Oh, I forgot to put in a Q3. So. Go back up to that code. Oh, yep, yeah, I typed Q2 twice. Okay. It'll use D, it'll use zero if you don't um, if you don't give it a value. I'm just gonna execute these things again, get down to my final plot, and there we go. We got a blue line. Let's help this a little bit. Let's do um, marker equals circle. Now there's things that are points there. And um, we can do ax dot um, uh, aspect, I think, equal. I 
aspect ratio, maybe. So that makes um, things equal. So we've got, <clears throat> this is our point O. We've got it stretched out five centimeters. And then this is supposed to be, the axis is supposed to be, uh, should make the ac look. What is the command there? It's uh, x set set aspect equal. This will make it look. There we go. That's actually what it looks like. We got a two meter long pendulum, and and it's stretched out five centimeters. Um, that doesn't look that great though. Let's make the ax dot set y limb from uh, um, if we take trajectory and get the um, first coordinate q uh, which is the zeroth one and do max comma trajectory also the same coordinate, min. This will give us the min and max that it moves. So we'll get it all on the screen. And it's supposed to be x limb. Still not a lot. Let's just do a negative uh, half a meter to half a meter. All right, that, look, that looks a little better. So we now have this thing plotted in its initial conditions. Um, and it and it sh we we want to make it wiggle around now. So we have a plot. Um, below that plot, <clears throat> we're going to need to write a couple more things we need to write here. Here we want to get ac this uh, plot command always returns a set of lines, and we want to update the data on those lines. So let's return that. And if we look at lines, it's a list of one line. So if I get the zero thing and I look at the um, x, uh, I think it's get data, notice that it returns those, those arrays. Those are the, the x coordinates of the four points and the y coordinates of the four points. So we're going to set that data every time it animates. So here I'll make a function called update. It's going to take the ith frame. And <clears throat> we know that um, we can get q1 in equals the ith row, zero column. And let's just get q2 uh, in equals so this will select out the value at that particular point in the trajectory for each of the queues. So we get those. And now I'm going to copy and paste these, this uh, line information here from above. That's the thing that we want to update. So here we're going to say lines, get the zero thing out of that list, set data, and then we just paste in that same function, make sure we close our parentheses. Um, okay. And so it should update the line now. So if I call that update and I say we'll get the um, 100th frame, the 100th value, and I press enter, notice that your graph shifted. All right. So basically it says, take that line, change the data to whatever the ith um, value in time is, and then, and then that shifts. OK, uh, the last piece of the puzzle here is that if you do uh, from matplotlib.animation import func animation. This thing um, will create the animation. It takes the figure, it takes the function update that will update the figure every time, 
And then this, we're just going to pass in um, uh, 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 the number of frames. In our case, it's like a thousand. And then we'll set also. Um, there's an interval command that can control how many milliseconds per frame. Go to the frame rate. So if we do this, we do. We're going to give it uh, the figure. We're going to give it the update function. Um, we're going to give it uh, frames equals length of dredge, which is a thousand in our case. And then there's an interval command. I'm going to say do about. Uh, try to do 20 milliseconds per function. So if I call that, I've been getting a bug. It's, it, should, it should just make the plot move. But for some reason, I've been having to do this. If I call update, there we go. We got some motion there. Right? <laughs> it's a... Uh, not a lot of motion, but let's change that. Let's say if we go right before we integrate, again, uh, actually all we have to do is right before we call this, let's um, say sys dot uh, initial conditions. of Q1, let's make it a bigger, let's make it um, a decimeter, and then do trag equals sys.integrate. I'm going to, um, to stop the animation, you can click the blue button here, and then I'm going to recreate the plot by running that cell, so the blue button's back, it's not moving, and I'm going to run this integration then I'm going to call func animate. It's not moving yet. This is you shouldn't have to call this update one, and I don't know what I'm doing wrong. But uh, here we go. It's not moving at real time, but um, but we see the see the motion here. Uh, if you want to speed it up, we could do um, sys dot uh, times equals np dot lin space zero to five and let's just do num equals um, two hundred stop this create the graph run the simulation There we go. That, that moves a little faster, so I'm not, try, I'm not trying to render so many, so many frames. Yeah. There we go. There, there is a um, visualization of your motion. So we've created the equations of motion, um, and we get the symbolic form, and then. PyDi has this sim system object where, sort of magically behind the scenes, it takes all that information, and you give it initial conditions and some numbers for the parameters, and it simulates that, integrates the equations of motion. And then lastly, we introduced here matplotlib that has plotting and, um, and this animation tool that can do, and, and matplotlib can do, some, can do 3D things. So you could make animations like that um, if you had a 3D object too, also using that pot lib. But PyDi, uh, at least the version that runs with um, Jupyter 4.0, has a three-dimensional um, simulation tool, and we'll show that next. So let's take a five-minute break, and um, I'm going to get a sip of water, and then I'll show you the 3D visualization tool, and then we will close with um, non-contributing forces, which I don't think will take too long to explain that. But any questions? We break here. Does that all make sense? What we're what we've done. If I go over advanced, uh, one of the things that seems like you guys voted for is advanced SimPy mechanics. I'll show you how how that system thing actually works in the background and what what it's doing, and s some of the details of that probably on the when we talk about that.
But that lets you um, simulate your system. And you guys should be able to do that uh, too with uh, your projects and such. And it, so we start with the pendulum up like that. Those are our new initial conditions. And then run the animation. <clears throat> and you can watch that while I'll go get some uh, water. I had uh, a local, yeah, so now, now I'm on my own c computer, and I'm under, oh, actually, I forgot, am I under, yeah, so this is the same notebook, I'm going to uh, run, run, run it all to get us back, back down there to the end, and uh, <clears throat> this is now running with a Jupiter 4.0 instead of 5.0. And, the, and these animations will work. And I'll, over the Christmas break, I'll try to get it working with 5.0 probably. Um, okay, I'm going to stop that animation and come down here and then let's uh, okay so um, if you do from pydie.viz import we're going to import a few things let's bring in a cylinder a sphere um, we're going to need some this thing called a visualization frame and a scene. And this is going to be ha have to be done on your own computer with the, with everything installed. So if you've got an error on that import, you, uh, that's um, it means you don't don't have it. So we got those things. So the key thing here is um, we've got reference frames and points defined in SimPy, and we want to um, pick a uh, a shape, some kind of shape, like a cylinder or a sphere, and attach it to those moving reference frames and points. And um, what I'll do is, for for each of our points of interest, we'll put a, we'll, add, we'll attach a sphere to it, and then for each of the um, arm, the arms of the pendulum, we'll attach a cylinder just to get a basic uh, space and. Uh, so this is how we create shapes with these kind of objects. And then this visualization frame, basically all it does is marry a reference frame and a point to a shape. And you're going to have to sometimes align the shapes, right? So if the axis of the cylinder is defined along its x-axis, but you want it along a y-axis of your reference frame, you might have to do some orientations to make sure you get axes aligned, right? So we've got separate things. Um, a cylinder doesn't know how it's supposed to be attached to that reference frame, and you've got to tell it how to do that. And a visualization frame smashes it all together. And then the scene, we basically tell the scene, well, here are all of the things that I want you to show in, in this scene, and then it'll show up. All right? So let's create um, <clears throat> a sphere. We'll call it S for uh, point AB. And if you look at um, that, it, ne it needs at least a radius. And you can also pass some other things in, like color and, and stuff. So let's start with that. We'll just do, um, let's just do a tenth of a meter in ra radius. And then uh, I'll say color equals green. And then we want another one for... Um, S, um, let's put one at BO. We'll make that the same size, color equals green. You can pick whatever colors you want. And then S, 
at C, the thir a third point, same size, color equals green. So we click create three spheres, and let's create um, let's create three cylinders, and I'll show you how you can you can also dynamically change. So these spheres uh, will always have a radius of 0.1 in the animation, but maybe you might want a sphere that changes in size or a, or something that changes in length. So what we'll do is uh, I'll show you how you can do that. You can um, I think this will work if I if I do um, the first cylinder, we'll call it um, cylinder from uh, O to, call it point AB, right? O to AB. And a cylinder has a length and a radius. So the length here, now if this doesn't work, don't be mad at me, I forget. I think we can pass in the symbol for Q1. So if you want it to change with time, we give it the symbol. And then we'll make the um, uh, radius of it to be half of what the sphere, sphere diameters are. And then we'll have a cylinder from O, I'm sorry, AB to B to BC. What color should we make the cylinders? That's going to be length L. Make that the same. Any preferable colors to go with green? Red. You're already thinking Christmas. It's not even Thanksgiving yet. All right, and then one more uh, cylinder. It's going to go from uh, BC to C. All right, and that's also going to be of length L. Okay, now we need to marry these things to um, our uh, reference frames and points. And the way that works is I'm just going to say uh, visualization, visualization frame 1 is going to marry, um, we're going to give it, if you look at this example, you basically give it a, um, a name, a reference frame and a point and a shape. Okay? So let's call this one the spring. And then uh, the reference frame is going to be, it's going to be in, in, it doesn't rotate. And then uh, we want it centered on a point. And the center of these, this is one key thing too. Um, for each of these shapes, it has an origin. The origin of the cylinder turns out to be this equal distance from the two ends of the cylinder. So we're going to need a point to attach that to. So I'm going to create a new point here from, um, from O um, dot locate new. And it's going to be Q1 divided by 2 times NX. So half, half the distance. And it's always going to be of length Q1. And then we add the shape to it. Cylinder um, O to AB. VF2, visualization frame, um, point AB. Also doesn't rotate. It's just a point, so we just use in. And then um, we can just pass in the point AB here. We already have that defined. And that's going to be the um, sphere AB. VF3 equals visualization frame. Uh, let's go ahead and just get knock out the points. Um, for all the points, since they don't, the spheres doesn't matter if they rotate. We can just use the in reference frame for all of them. And this is BO and SBO. VF4 equals visualization frame. Um, C, right? We need a point C in the end frame, PC, uh, SC. And then VF5 equals visualization frame. <clears throat> um, 
this is the compound pendulum. Let's name it that. Uh, this rotates, right? So we need to put B. And we also need a center point. So I'm going to do PAB dot locate new. And this is going to be L divided by 2 times uh, B, Y, and that's negative. And we give it the cylinder uh, A to B, C, A, B to B, C, and then one more V, F, 6. Simple pendulum rotates with C. And then uh, we need a new point here to BC dot locate new negative L divided by 2 times uh, C dot Y and then cylinder B to BC. Okay, six things we've attached the shape to a reference frame and a point. And the key thing for the cylinders is that these points have to be halfway. It's always the center of the cylinder is always at the uh, equidistance from each end of the cylinder. All right, I, th I think hopefully this will work. I think we might have one error, at least this one. Locate new. Oh, um, the value. Oh, I forgot. We needed. Um, what am I missing on these? It needs the. Uh, O dot locate new. A name. Oh, I forgot the name. You need an arbitrary name for all the points. Um, I just throw in X for all of them. Doesn't doesn't really matter what they're called. Uh, locate new takes three positional arguments. Oh yeah. Okay, there we go. So make sure I had some syntax errors there. Try to copy what I've got. And uh, the scene <coughs> object then takes the reference frame that you want to view things from, some origin that all of these uh, positions are defined with respect to. Um, so it's like a, a, a reference frame and some origin point. We'll use O and N here. And then you pass in all the visualization frames, one after the other. So we'll do um, scene equals scene. We'll create the scene. We pass in um, the reference frame N, the origin O, and then VF1, VF2, VF3, VF4, VF5, VF6. All right, now, the, the final finale here. If I do scene.display uh, scene uh, ipython, it's a function, I get an error. Oh, I forgot one thing to scene. Scene takes an optional argument um, called sys, and that we're going to pass in the system. And the system has all of the simulation information. If you didn't pass in sys, you'd have to define the trajectories of all these coordinates explicitly. But it's already built into sys, so we get sys. Now, another attribute error. Am I doing that right? Scene takes uh, system. Sorry. You have to say system equals the system we had. Jeez, why well, we get so many errors? Didn't work. That Q1 didn't work. I think our spring's not going to work. I thought that. All right. Let's uh, cancel VF1. That's that's too bad. But uh, get rid of it here, and we're not going to have a spring-like thing. And then call this. Okay, here we finally go. 
Let me get rid of some of these things. Okay, so what it does, it opens up a little GUI tool here, shows your initial conditions, all your constants. And, and these, these boxes are editable, in fact, if you pass in the system. And then we've got something down here, but play, pause, and stop. You can drag this, loop. But if you change things up there, you can also press rerun simulation, and it'll generate the new trajectory just with the button press. So it's pretty convenient. Uh, but if we come down here, right, we see this thing we created. And if I go ahead and just play, there's, there's the motion. But now it's in a 3D window. And um, I can put it on loop, play it. Right, I can drag uh, two fingers, zooms. You can pan. So this becomes pretty useful then to understand, to see the basic, you know, motions in 3D of things. Um, <clears throat> it, it only has a lot of, you know, very primitive shapes. It, can't, it doesn't currently have functionality to put lots of fancy stuff in it. But uh, let's stop this. And, um, like, we could put this at, uh, uh, just to give an example, 2.5 rerun the simulation, and you can see now the initial condition is such that it's sideways. So it's, it's quite convenient, and um, we divided those uh, lengths of the cylinder symbolically, so I can also do this. Let's make L be um, 2. Uh, are we going to notice that? Um, I guess you will. Let's make it 3, rerun the simulation, right? It got longer. Okay? So that's, that's it there. You now have the power to visual, visualize your simulations in 3D, at least in this basic way. If you want to do fancy, fancy things, you know, there's other tools and stuff too. Um, but this will give you basic uh, ability to visualize those. All right, questions here? A lot of new things. Um, I'll post uh, some notebooks. That, there's other examples, and um, for example, in the PyDi repository, um, there's an example. I've showed you this examples folder. This is, I'll show you right now the, uh, here's a this thing called the chaos pendulum. And let me just go there. Go to by day. So this is a tutorial that I, I um, Professor Ecke taught this class the last few years, well, last 30 years probably, and um, I would come in sometimes and give a, uh, a shorter version of what I've shown you. Here is a, a system that looks like this. <clears throat> this is in 3D. It's basically a pendulum that swings but has a, a plate that rotates. And, um, and it's an interesting little system due to its chaotic behavior, but if I restart and run all, or run all here, go to the very bottom, we could have a look at... Um, the visualization for that. So this is like a plate with a, um, if I play that, oh, I got it sideways. Okay, so there's a 3D one for you. And, th and there's a number, this example has a lot of commentary in it, so it should be reasonable to um, let's see. Okay, questions? Josh. Are you running this off your server? This is running off of um, my local computer. Yeah. yeah. Mine's having it's way too slow. I mean, it could just be a personal problem. It's you know, taking time steps of just doing all the calculations and such. It took like five minutes to load this window. 
Mm-hmm. <clears throat> it, sh- it shouldn't. It shouldn't. Um, yeah, this thing is, is a JavaScript library, and it does depend on the speed of your browser uh, for these animations to happen, but it, it's, it's based on WebGL, so it's using your GPU if you have one, and it's using whatever your graphics card is to do the 3D stuff. So this thing right here should run just fine as long as you're, you're in a modern browser with, uh, and your computer has a graphics chip. Oh, I'm running it on my ThinkPad, but we should check that it should run fine on this. Uh, last, you guys, um, you got Windows. I mean, all everybody last year has run this just fine, I think. So I don't know, something's fishy here. Um, we can look at it later, I think. Sorry, but uh, yeah, all these these animations should run um, as fast as your computer can, you know, do the 3D graphics. And these are pretty simple 3D graphics, so every every modern computer should fly on that. But bought the wrong computer, huh? <laughs> we can look at that later. <clears throat> okay. Any other questions here? So for your um, projects, you know, I, w- I would like to see something like this, some some kind of visualization of whatever motion that you all are investigating. Okay. I don't have if you want to save it as a video you would need to like screen capture it or something. I don't have a save to video function. Uh, the matplotlib animations, though, they do have a save to video. It'll save it as a MP3 or things like that. Um, not an MP3, an MP4 or whatever you call them. Uh, but I've made videos out of these before by um, using one of those screen recorders, and it comes out all right. Uh, Chris, you had a question? Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome to use whatever you like. Um, other tools. This, uh, this one, this 3D one works sort of seamlessly with the Simpy mechanics and and stuff. So you don't have you won't have to type as much in the end. Uh, but you can. I, I don't care what tool you use really. There, I do want you to solve the problem with Python and Simpy mechanics. But beyond that. Um, and the, well, let me, I guess, uh, everything's got to run in the notebook, right, for your, fi- what you're turning in for your final project. And um, you, the Jupyter Notebook can technically run 20-some different languages. So if you want to figure out how to get any other thing running in it, you probably can. Is that too broad of an answer? <laughs> uh, use whatever animation tool you want, but it's got to show up in the notebook. When I run your notebook, I want to see the result. And so I, th- I think the easiest path is probably going to be this um, for now. But if you find it limiting or want want like want to load in a CAD model or something, then you might need to grab and look for another tool. Okay. Other questions? All right. Let's use the last bit of time here to talk about non-contributing forces. <clears throat> And this is the last main, last main topic from the book that I want to uh, cover. And then we'll sort of do these other topics that are um, <clears throat> not necessarily tied to the book and not necessarily And some other things that are more modern and useful, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, <clears throat> so let's look at this problem that we had again. We're working with this block that slides along the rod. It's got this pendulum. Here. So we had these non-contributing forces, right? We did not have to calculate the forces at this joint, forces at that joint, uh, the forces between the block and the rod, etc. But let's say, for example, we want to know what the contact forces are at the point um, PAB. Okay? 
Uh, we've eliminated those using Kane's method. They're not there for it. We can't find them, right? They're not, not available. Uh, you could go back through and calculate the free body diagram and, and everything else, but there's a relatively easy way to get at those. Um, if I think about this block, and there's that point on it, <clears throat> if I imagine If I imagine that that uh, point uh, fictitiously can move away from where it's supposed to be, and in this case, um, we're going to say at a velocity of uh, u4 and u5. So we're going to introduce these two speeds. And these two speeds we call auxiliary speeds. And um, so the idea is, is that we imagine that there can be a velocity between um, this point that's supposed to stay in the same place. We don't introduce any new coordinates, but we're going to introduce that there, there can be motion. And additionally, if we look at those two points, we can imagine that, in our case, there's no um, rotational friction here. But they have to have they would have to have equal and opposite forces here to hold them together. Okay? And I've introduced two new scalars, Fy and Fx, that represent the magnitude of the components of that force that has to hold those two points together. Okay? So if I do that, and now I consider um, the velocity of, we'll call this PAB um, A, PAB B. The idea is that I now rewrite my velocity terms of every point in the system and every in any angular velocities and include this fictitious velocity u4 and u5 that we know are actually zero. But we just, we're just we going to introduce them. So, for example, um, the velocity of PAB now in N is going to be what it was before, and that was uh, u1 NX. But then we're going to add these other components, u4 NX plus u5 in y. And when we figure out the resultant on AB, the resultant force, similarly, um, we had um, negative kq1 in x minus cu1 in x. Uh, plus this force we had acting on the system. Well, now we're going to include, well, what, what forces um, here would be there if these, uh, these uh, non-contributing forces. We're going to include those in terms of Fx and Fy. So your people, that's something new in Windows. Your people. Um, so I'm just going to add uh, Fx in X plus Fy in Y. Okay. 
So these are really zero, and these we don't have to calculate normally. So well, what do we do here? All we do is calculate all the velocities, calculate all the accelerations, starting with these questions, equations, and calculate this resultant. Figure out fr and fr star, <clears throat> but now instead of having three r's, we're going to do r um, 1 to 5. So we're going to have uh, five fr equa equations. And let's, I think we should jump back to SymPy to do that. Um, so what I want to do is I want to open up our notebook from last time. Yeah, the one, this one that we were working on, we animated in it. I'm going to uh, make a copy of it. We're going to edit, edit that notebook. So this is a copy of the notebook that we ended with the map. Um, or where, wherever you were at in it. We're not going to do the animations. But I'm going to start at the beginning. Oh, I've I got to show you my screen for this to be useful. Okay. Now um, we're going to have these auxiliary speeds. So I'm going to add a u um, two, or sorry, u four, u five equals me dynamic symbols. And then um, we're also going to add these um, non-contributing force components. So I'll introduce FX and FY. And they're also going to be uh, dynamic. They change with time. And then we continue on to find things as we have. I forgot to do U1 and U2, I guess. Make sure you execute everything. All right. Now, <clears throat> once we get to the linear velocities, we're going to change this velocity now plus um, u3 times nx plus u4 times ny. And then when we go and calculate these subsequent velocities and accelerations, they're now going to have u4s and u5s in them. All right, so we see these u4s. I used, oh, sorry, this is supposed to be U4 and U5. Now we'll see U4s and U5s in these velocities. But they're actually zero. And then the partial velocities, we now get partial velocities with respect to U4 and U5. So we add those in. to all the partial velocities that we need to calculate. All right? So we've got these new, <clears throat> you know, some partial velocities show up with respect to U4 and U5, these fictitious velocities, ficti fictitious generalized speeds. And we can calculate accelerations. We're going to see u4 dots and u5 dots show up. And now um, here is the resultant force. We also need an fx term and fy times ny. So we add those in. 
Those are those non-contributing forces that we want to know. Continue on, mass and inertia. Now when we get to general, generalized active forces, we have to add in U4 and U5. So we're going to have five equations now. So if I calculate them, notice that right, Fx, Fy show up in some of them, these non-contributing components of that non-contributing force that we're interested in. And then if I calculate the generalized inertia force, Um, we're going to see it's going to be functions of now these extra u's because our accelerations have them in there. So now it doesn't print. Doesn't print. I think I didn't print it. So here's fr and fr star now. Now they are five long, right, we have five equations, and we see, right, U5 dots in there, U4 dots. Add them together, we got our equations of motion, and if we see, you know, what dynamic symbols are in there, it's got these time-varying Fy and Fx, U4, U5, U4, right, they're all in there. Okay, so now at this point, um, what you do, if I take that, those equations and um, substitute for uh, U4 diff, make that zero because we know it's a fictitious velocity, U5 diff, it's also a fictitious velocity, and then I'm going to sub after that a u4 and a zero and u5 a zero. If I plug all those in, <clears throat> now all of those terms associated with the u4s and u5s go away, and um, the the equations, the first three are associated with our um, actual generalized speeds. The last two are these equations that came from these fictitious generalized speeds. <clears throat> so, uh, if you notice carefully, those last two equations have fx and fy in it. And all we need to do now is, if I uh, grab those last two equations, they are the um, uh, negative 2 to the end of the 0th column. They're the two equations. And if I do sm.solve for fx and fy, I get fx equals a function of all of my u's and q's and u dots. But there's no, I lied to you, there's a u4. Why didn't that get substituted out? Oh, I, I'm using the uh, wrong subs. Uh, here, I should do 0 equals and we'll overwrite zero. And then I need to use that when I solve it. All right, so the gist of this is, is that I use those extra equations of motion that aren't really there, they're, they're sort of non-existing, to, to find fx as a function of all the actual generalized speeds, their derivatives, and the q's. So there's fx and fy. That tells me what the force is as a function of time at that joint. So you introduce fictitious generalized speeds for every motion you're going to have. If you have a 3D joint, you'll have three, you could have three um, generalized speeds for its position. And then if it, um, if it also, you don't know things about uh, the, uh, if you don't know that, if it's a non-contributing force, 
two that has to do with rotation, you could have these fictitious angular generalized speeds also introduced. Uh, and you, add, you just go through the motion, you calculate these extra things, and then you substitute, make all those zero, and then you end up with these extra equations that you can solve for any of these unknown forces and torques that you may uh, want to know at, the, at, the, at that joint or at anywhere where it's a non-contributing force. And then if I, and then the top three equations there, um, it has fx and fy in it. And th those top three equations are the equations of motion that we got before, except that we should set fx, fx and fy to zero. So you get the same equations of motion associated with u1, u2, and u3, but they'll have some terms in there that um, you can also set to zero. But the extra equations you get, you can use those, and we get these functions. So that tells, now I can calculate what the, func what the force is at any given time. And you notice, like, Fy has to do with the weight that, that's hanging on it, and then all this is the acceleration terms, right, due to the acceleration of the pendulum and how it's pulling, how fast it's spinning. And here, right, we see our, we got this pull, we got the uh, spring and damper pulling on it. We got the force that we push on it. And then this is the X component of all the accelerations of that pendulum swinging below. All right, I'm over time. We can talk, we can talk about that a little more, but it's, uh, there's a short section in the book uh, it has a different example, if you want to go through, that is a little more complicated, and it has uh, uh, both non-contributing torques and forces. But that's the gist of how to get those forces back out if you are interested in them. In and you often are. It might be like you got a cam that's run, roll, pushing on an engine uh, uh, block. Uh, I mean, a, uh, not a block, but a... Uh, huh. Not the piston. What's the uh, thing that opens up and down? Opens up the the valve. Cam pushing on a valve. You might it might you might model it as a smooth surface interaction, uh, and you want to get the the force that's pressed on there. So you know like fatigue, right? How how many times is this? What's the force that I'm repetitively pressing on this? You back that out this way. Things like that. All right. Okay, folks. Have a happy Thanksgiving. Eat a lot of food. Gain a lot of weight. And we'll uh, all come back in our glory of uh, big stomachs. <laughs> <laughs>